first of all, I just want each of the additional uh, participants just to say, why did you join the platform? So, do you want to go first, Suzanne? Yes, thank you. Um, as, as Joe said, uh, I'm representing the European Heart Network, which is a Brussels-based alliance of heart foundations. And uh, it, had, it ought to be fairly obvious why we joined the platform. Um, cardiovascular disease is a very major burden. We're trying to reduce this burden. We're, right? We're trying to reduce the premature death and disease. Um, and what we're looking at here are the risk factors. We have in, in the European Union over two million people who die every year from cardiovascular diseases. About almost a quarter of a million people die from cardiovascular diseases before they reach the age of 65. Uh, eight risk factors um, explain about 61% of cardiovascular diseases globally. These are uh, alcohol use, tobacco use, hypertension, blood cholesterol, blood glucose, overweight and obesity, and physical inactivity. So six out of these are actually related to the theme of the platform, namely diet and physical activity. And that's pretty much why we, pretty much why we joined. Anything we can do to address the risk factors and therefore help to reduce the burden from cardiovascular diseases is something we need to work with. Yeah. Herman, physical activity. Yes, it, it was for us uh, an honor to be invited to come on the platform. Uh, we, we live, eat, sleep and drink uh, physical activity in our industry, uh, representing 40,000 facilities in Europe and about 40 million consumers who are active in our both for-profit and not-for-profit health and fitness centers. Our vision by joining the, the platform was to indeed do the things that Dominic presented today, to form alliances with uh, food companies, with other organizations, NGOs on the platform, to establish specific actions. And uh, we are in the process of doing that. And I think we need uh, a little bit more, let's say, forceful action maybe among the participants uh, to, to achieve that. And the food industry, Lisa? Um, well, as the representative here today of the CIAA, the European Food and Drink uh, Industry Organization at the European level, um, we joined the, uh, we were one of the finding members of the platform. We're very proud to be able to say that we are. We've played a very active role over the last five years. Um, our role as economic operators, I think, should be fairly obvious as those, uh, as representative of the industry which makes a lot of food and drink products serving 500 million consumers every day. Um, we understand the role that we can play in being part of the solution in helping to tackle obesity and other non-communicable diseases. Our efforts alone, I mean, they can they mostly focus in those areas of our core business. So we're looking at issues such as product reformulation, where it can bring immediate effect, uh, benefits to the consumer, um, improving consumer information, giving consumers the kind of at-a-glance factual information about our products to help them make informed food choices, and also supporting the efforts of many of our members in their efforts on responsible marketing um, and advertising of their products. We're also involved in some of those areas which are less traditional areas of our involvement, and those have been also in promoting uh, physical activity and um, well, assisting or encouraging nutrition education where that is relevant and appropriate. Um, but obviously, those are not the core areas of our activity. We focus mostly on the, the parts where we can make a huge difference and hopefully, together with all the stakeholders, be able to have a positive impact in being able to address this pro problem. Okay, thank you. And uh, Joe Jewell, European Public Health Alliance. Um, well, probably in a very similar vein to Susanna from the European Heart Network, uh, IFA is the umbrella association for public health NGOs and health professionals in Europe. So, I mean, obesity and public health in general is part of our core work. So any initiative from the European Commission that tries to tackle and improve health outcomes, we are going to be involved in. Um, Obesity is at the heart of our work. We have the European Net Heart Network as one of our members. We have uh, the International Diabetes Federation. Um, and so really anything that is 
going to approach diet-related diseases we want to be a part of, um, and we want to contribute positively. But of course, as Philippe mentioned, the civil society organisations in the platform do have a role to play as watchdogs. This is an innovative process. It's you know, focusing on voluntary commitments, and so we want to be involved and participate to ensure that there's public health evidence that we can contribute our expertise from within our membership to ensure that the commitments are going in the right direction. And so, you know, discussions today on the future of the platform, we have many suggestions, and we will be, you know, sort of contributing our suggestions to how we can improve the mandate of the platform, how you can improve guidance on the commitments, how you can improve uh, the evaluation as well, because we've spoken a lot about monitoring today, but there's not been so much of a focus on the relevance of the commitments, how they are based on evidence, and what sort of impact they're going to be having. So that's sort of the areas in which we intend to contribute to the process. Thank you. Right, on to some of the questions we received. First of all, about national platforms. How many national platforms on diet, physical activity and health are in operation? And have those platforms, national platforms, been involved in the evaluation of the EU platform? Is that one for F Philippe? Or Vanessa? Yeah. There are a number of, of national platforms. We looked at six national platforms in particular, and those were the ones that basically were comparable to the EU platform in terms of the way it actually functioned. Um, so there are a few out there. There are definitely six. The question is in the def definition of it, but we looked in particular at, at the, um, the ones that were similar to the EU national platform. And what countries are they? Robert. While, while uh, Vanessa's getting her list, I think I would like to add a point, which is that some voluntary multi-stakeholder cooperative platforms exist also at regional level, so it's not necessarily at the level of the member state, and some are thematic. I mean, I think that Dominic's idea, uh, the, the Green Lace project, is going to be a multi-stakeholder activity in the member states where it takes off, devoted to delivering that. And I think similarly, therefore, we can say that you don't have to have a comprehensive approach. The question is, are you getting in... Are you able in a national level to, to, to get many stakeholders support, to support one issue that matters at national level? It, we shouldn't, in the European Union at least, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but at the European Union, member states and local level, they have to choose what suits them. There isn't, we're not trying to say this platform must be a, a cookie cutter approach. In terms of what countries they were, we looked at Portugal, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Germany, and the Netherlands, and found that Portugal, Hungary, Italy, and Poland were inspired by the EU platform, whereas uh, Germany and the Netherlands had not been mostly um, because they'd basically been created pre prior to the EU platform. Okay. Um, an associated uh, question here is, are there plans for further outreach and communications to engage national platforms and partners, for example, showcasing successful projects that can be replicated elsewhere? Maybe, maybe I could take that on behalf of the Commission, Philippe. It seems to me clear that the, the dissemination piece is part of what we're doing now. And I think it's it's very striking that in, in, the, in the academic literature about what does it take to make an, an, F, an impact through multi-stakeholder approaches, examples like the, the Fleur Bay Lavanti experiment, to the extent they've been written up, it seems to be 10 to 15 years. So five years seems a long time in politics, but it's quite a short time in these experiments. My belief is that part of the, the work that the evaluation report enables us to do now is to turn to the member states in the Health Council and say, here are some approaches which have worked. And you can either say, I want a platform, or you can say, I want to push one particular aspect, which may not even be one of the five drivers within the, the EU platform. So I think it's very much a question now of saying, as, as the evaluation concludes, it can work, and therefore the question is, which bits would a member state or a region want to make work? Joe, is it possible to add something here? I know we're very short of time, but uh, one of the things we, at some point, we had one of the regional platforms uh, visiting us at the European platform, and I think one of the things that came out of the evaluation and is now put on the table again by the Commission is priorities and specific objectives, because I think it's easier to evaluate and it's easier to measure what you're doing if you actually at least agree about a few, on a few objectives. 
won't agree on everything. We've seen that for the last five years in the platform, but a couple of specific objectives going in the right direction might be a good advice for national and regional uh, platforms, and I hope we'll be able to move in that direction with the European platform as well. Okay. We've got a question here that was for Dominic. So, I don't, Dominic, are you able to get to a microphone? That you indicated that messages should not be considered restrictive. Kids don't want to be told what to do. Why is this a problem? Surely childhood is in part learning the rules about life and society. Good question. Uh, I agree with you that children have to have parameters within which they live their lives, otherwise we have chaos. Um, but in order for a communications program to work, which is delivered at uh, a distance, if you like, because it's not like your living is not in the home where their parents are saying you can't go out after 10 o'clock at night or whatever it is. It, it's something that they have to absorb from um, a, a medium, a, th a third party. And if you say to kids, particularly teenagers, you can't do this, you can't eat that, you mustn't do that, they will automatically do the opposite. And I'm afraid it's just the way they are. So what, if we were doing this, if we were running a commercial campaign for a food product, we would certainly not be saying to them negative messages. We would be, obviously, because that's the way commercial communications works, pointing out the positives. And because this is not about a particular food product, but about a way of life, we felt that presenting it as a positive thing to do, uh, something that would help their social lives, help them with their peer groups, uh, was the best way to go. And that's what the research showed. OK. Uh, there's a couple of questions here which we're not going to have time to discuss fully, but I just want to answer them. One was, is there adequate emphasis on fresh foods, including fruit and vegetables, rather than processed food reformulation? Within the platform, there are members that are representing the fresh food, uh, fresh fruit and vegetable organisations, and there are um, uh, commitments from those uh, um, organisations. And then another one, could you explain in more detail about how you measured the impact uh, in the evaluation process and what was the research question and how is the data collected and what were the main findings? Certainly, if you go on to DG Sanko's website and looked at the evaluation report, you'll find all of that information there. It's a hundred and something or other page report plus case studies. So I just want to, because we're short of time, um, if Herman and Joe and Lisa and Suzanne would like to quickly wrap up about their thoughts for the future and, and what they would like to see the, the platform bring. Sermon. Yeah, I, I came prepared with six suggestions to improve the platform for the next three years from our point of view. Number one is that we believe that uh, the leadership of the platform should actively stimulate and facilitate interaction between the different actors uh, on the agenda and give physical activity more prominence as has been mentioned several times uh, today. But we definitely would like to, to have physical activity on every agenda and not as it is now, maybe one out of every four, of four agendas. Number two, we are a strong supporter of what was mentioned in the evaluation report to have workshops. Now it's day-long meetings with plenary sessions, and we believe we could really stimulate the interaction between the actors on the platform if there would be more workshops for smaller groups and then come back to the plenary. Third one is that, and it was mentioned by Robert and Philippe, that we should invite actors who are not yet there. I'm thinking specifically about education about the health insurance companies who have a vested interest in improving health in the European Union and, and maybe actors from the healthcare sector. Number four is to create an annual, and this is where really it's a platform for action, the actors together could think about getting a Get Active Europe Week annual activity where many actors can be working together and making this happen in Europe to get people to exercise more and eat more responsibly. Number five is indeed the communication. I think all the actors on the platform could do more on their own websites to make the platform more prominent and put their commitments on their websites uh, also as a form of commitment for them to the platform. So I think the marketing of the platform could be improved through that measure. And number six, DG EAC Sport, through the uh, Lisbon Treaty, there is of course a bigger prominence for sport also from the European Commission that there could be more and maybe involvement from the DG EAC uh, sport unit into the platform to also from their side give more input on the physical activity side. So those are our six recommendations, so to speak, for the go forward for the platform. Suzanne? 
Well, I think I formulated one of uh, the major uh, proposals we have, which is to, to focus and to prioritize, and I would like to repeat that. I think it's very important. And I also think it's important to remember that the platform, as was pointed out initially by, by Robert Madlin and others, is only one tool in the toolbox. We are talking about very, very serious burdens of diseases, the whole chronic disease uh, area, will, which really the platform is only part of it, can only address part of it. So make the platform better by focusing, but make sure that we do more than that. Joe, a few words. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, when we're looking at where to go next, um, I think we need to build on the constructive dialogue which we have set in place. I mean, I only joined EFA in 2008, but since I've been representing EFA in the platform, I haven't seen any fights or punches thrown. So, I mean, there is a certain amount of constructive dialogue there. Fundamental differences still exist, but I think we need to build on that. Um, I think we're looking forward to the review of the nutrition, you know, the nutrition strategy, the midterm review, to have a look at the overall picture. Susanna said there's multiple determinants of diet-related diseases, so we need to look at all the tools available, and we shouldn't just focus only on the platform, but the platform is an integral tool. Um, Obviously, it's too early to see any remarkable results from the platform. We've heard that discussed. The data's not there. Also, these things take a long time. So, I mean, we're looking forward to continual evaluation of the platform before it's actually communicated as an entire success. So I think information strategy at this stage is, is where we're looking for. Um, and looking at some of the suggestions from the evaluation itself, yes, there is a need for reform in terms of the mandate. Um, we're looking for more concrete and less numerous commitments. I mean, I think there's been a, too much of a focus on education and lifestyle, which has been sometimes frustrating, and that, uh, you know, we need to move on from that. Uh, we want a bit of guidance as to where the commitments should be, where they're going to be most effective. Um, and then also we're hoping for a sort of comprehensive assessment of the effectiveness of those commitments, um, and, and then we can start communicating, you know, where to go next. So, I mean, I think that's... I think that's, from our perspective, what we're looking for over the next years. Thank you. And finally, the food industry, what do you expect from the platform in the future? Okay, well, going forward, I mean, I think there have been a lot of very good points made here today, not only about the, the kind of the overview that we've seen with the independent review of the platform's work to date. It has been a very constructive forum for dialogue and for action. I think the focus on action there is very important. Certainly from our industry perspective, um, we're pleased to see that the, the efforts that we've made over the last five years definitely do demonstrate that a self-regulatory approach can work. It is working. If you think that in the last five years that we've now managed to have front of pack labeling, um, at least on a voluntary level, um, from many food and drink companies, then this is something that we wouldn't have had if we were still waiting for, for, for the, the outcome of the food information proposal. I think also on product reformulation, despite the economic downturn, and we've seen that the efforts of the industry are continuing in this area. I think it's important what we've heard about scale and scope and ambition and creativity about um, the commitments that have been made. This is something which we, we, we fully agree with. It, 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 we need to see where we can scale up and increase the impact of the commitments that have been made and that are successful. We need to also think about um, the future work program. I think it's, it's good to see that we have a very clear outline of what, what the next steps in the EU platform will be, how the work program will, 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 will come together, the, the renewed mandate, and um, looking at the monitoring process. This is something which we fully support, having monitoring of commitments. It's an expensive process, and it needs, to, it needs the, the efforts and time um, of, of all stakeholders, really, to ensure that we're going in the right direction. Finally, on communication, this is something which is very important. Certainly from the CIAA perspective, we're trying to do our best to communicate about the work that we're doing under the platform. Um, we have an active lifestyles website where we put all the overview of um, the up-to-date efforts and activities of our members under the EU platform process. We've also, I'm pleased to just quickly show you, we've produced this nice second edition Healthy Lifestyles brochure, which is all about balanced diets, and it provides an overview of all of the CIAA members' activities in the, both the core areas of our business and those less traditional areas of activity. So you can download it from our website if you'd like more information on that. 
Okay, thank you, Lisa. Uh, and we've run out of time now, so it just remains for me to thank all of the speakers and debaters for coming, um, giving up their weekend, their Saturday, um, and thank them in the usual style. Thank you. <laughs>